tell them if there's a there's a forever kingdom await, awaiting those who know Jesus. And he invites all to come. He invites all to come to sit down and feast with him in his forever kingdom. And all you have to do is come. Come by faith in Christ. Jesus uh, has just taught this. And he came to make everything ready for that. His work on Calvary's cross, his victorious resurrection from death, would accomplish everything that was needed for you to come by faith in him. The invitation was free. All you do is come. You come freely with saving faith in him and his gospel. And in today's passage, he's going to show us that when you come, accepting that free gift of salvation, life looks differently after you come than it did before. Before we accepted the invitation, Jesus, his teaching in today's passage is not how to become a Christian. It's key. It's not how to become a Christian. If so, none of us would be a Christian because none of us can live like this perfect. But Jesus' teaching today is very tied to our initial decision to come to Christ because it's what life looks like when you do come to Christ. Once you do become a Christian, once you do offer His free gift of grace by faith alone in Christ, it's what life looks like after that happens. Stephen Cole says this, Salvation is both absolutely free and yet it costs you your very life. You receive it freely at no expense to you, but once you receive it, you have just committed everything you are and have to Jesus Christ. And so I want to look uh, at, at, at true discipleship and what Jesus calls true discipleship this morning uh, in, here in these first verses of our passage. Large crowds, uh, Luke says, followed Jesus. And for some preachers, I'll tell you, this would be an ego trip, right? We want to see all this blue space filled. To see a bunch of people coming would be pretty cool. And the temptation when that happens is to do whatever we can to get them to stick around. Even sometimes water down the message Ignore truth so we wouldn't scare him away. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. He looked at this crowd that was following him and he said some of the hardest things to hear that we've heard him say. He boldly told them the truth of what life looked like for one who truly accepted his invitation to salvation. Preparing them for what they were getting into if they did choose to follow him. So they wouldn't be surprised later and maybe turn away from him. And in so doing, maybe possibly showing they never were a disciple to begin with. So, at the risk of Jesus, uh, of, of any of these people giving him the hand, you, I don't know if they still say it today. You remember that old phrase, giving him the hand, or give him the hand? Yeah? At the risk of, of them just saying, nah, Joseph will do that now. He's in trouble, and he knows he's got something he's not supposed to have. He'll, he'll do this, he'll go, <laughs> like, don't come and take this from me. Right? At the risk of, of people doing that to Jesus and saying, no, it's okay, I'm good. I'm leaving. At the risk of that, Jesus didn't tickle their ears. But he told them how strong their commitment should be when they came to him. He cared more about their spiritual condition than his popularity. He cared more about them knowing the truth than having a false following. A false disciple. He loved them too much to keep them in a delusion that would lead to their destruction. How gracious and loving. He's looking out for their best. So just a quick question before we really jump into this. Do we care more that people like us or that they know the truth? Do we really love people or do we selfishly love their admiration of us as we avoid speaking hard truth to them, giving them a false sense of security and redefine discipleship. You see, Christian and disciple 
are the same thing. Christian and disciple are the same thing. There's this weird idea that you become a Christian and then you become a disciple. No. When you become a Christian, you become a disciple. A disciple is one who learns from his or her master and walks in their footsteps. This is the essence of discipleship to which every single Christian is called. Discipleship is not an optional next level of commitment for the really devoted. As if, you know, you buy tickets to a concert and you get in, and, you know, and if you, you really pay the money, you get front row. If you really pay the money, you can get the backstage pass. It's not like that. A disciple isn't just the one that's backstage and just got that next level of commitment to Jesus. No, a disciple is one who is trusted in Jesus as their Savior. It's all one thing. This, being a disciple is what you are when you become a Christian. When God gives you life in Him, you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Matthew 7.21, listen to what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Listen to him in John 15, 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. 1 John 2, 3 through 4. Listen closely. And by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in Him. John goes on to say in verse 6, Whoever says He abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which He walked. That doesn't sound like two classes of Christians to me, does it? To you? Those who are Christians are disciples. All Christians who accept that his free invitation to salvation are to be devoted disciples who follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And so Jesus describes to us in this passage what that looks like. Remember, again, this is not how you get saved, but what a life of repentance and faith looks like once it is saved. It's the evidence of our salvation. In verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's pretty intense. What does he mean by that? Obviously, Jesus doesn't mean a literal hate in the way that we think of hate. He's, he's taught us to love our fellow believers, he's taught us to love our families. He's taught us to love even our enemies. Love is our mark. John MacArthur says that hate in this context is a Semitic way, a Jewish way of expressing preference. Warren Wiersbe says it means to love less. The idea is that our love for Jesus should, by, should be our supreme love, greater than the closest of earthly relationships. Should any human relationship conflict with our love for Jesus or our commitment to Him, we prefer His way over their way. His desires over their desires. This would have been very real in, in Jewish homes where there was often a negative reaction or even rejection to one who followed Christ. J.C. Ryle says, We must choose rather to displease those we love most on earth, most upon earth, than to displease Him who died for us on the cross. Some have said it like this. Compared to the expression of our love for Jesus, our love for others should be seen as hatred. We should love Jesus so much. Family relationships, friendships, they are good things. They are blessings. They are means of His grace to us. But note this. Good things can easily become idols to worship. Our affection for them can surpass our affection for God. Our love for them can hold much sway over how we lead our lives instead of our love for God directing how we lead our lives. So if our expressions of love to our, our kids are keeping us from living as a biblical disciple or guiding them to be one, we need to make a value adjustment. Let me just give you a couple of things. 
If our love, let me just use kids for example. If, if our love for our kids are so great that our life is consumed by them in such an unhealthy way that keeps us from growing as a disciple ourselves, then we've got a value judgment messed up there. That our expressions of our love to our kids or grandkids or whatever, if that, if that so consumes us that it keeps us from studying the Word, if it keeps us from praying for them, which is the best parenting, then we've, we've, we've idolized them. If, if we're so consumed with their schedules, maybe they're older kids, and, and you know, we don't share the gospel with others because we're so consumed with our kids, something, something's wrong here. If we're not growing as a, as a disciple because we love something or someone too much, we've got a wrong value adjustment. If, if, if our, our spouses or our parents or our brothers or sisters whoever, those we love dear, if we care more for what they think about us and that keeps us from, from, from living as a faithful disciple, we've got a wrong value. If we bail on living as a faithful disciple of Jesus to avoid conflict in our family, to avoid hard conversations in our family, or to even avoid disappointing a family member or a friend, then we need a value adjustment. Sometimes following Jesus it's going to bring separation in the closest of relationships. This is, this is real in other cultures and other religions. It's very real. It's real here, too. But it's more pronounced, I think, in other cultures and religions. I mean, you can, you can follow Christ in another culture and get excommunicated from your family, another religion. Here it happens, but it's a little more subtle. There's just... There's, there's like a shaming. There's like sometimes families will make a, a believer the black sheep of the family, you know, and it's almost, they're almost trying to shame you into not following Jesus closely. Sorry about that, Mike. I'll try to not move this It's hard. But look, it, when we follow Jesus, it's going to cause separation sometimes in our family relationships. But if our love for Jesus is supreme, that separation won't be a reason to keep from living faithfully as his disciple around them. In fact, in the end, it may be a huge reason of why they come to Christ. Because here's the truth. Listen. This is so true. Loving God more than them is loving them in the best way. If you love them more than you love God, you don't love them in the best way. Why? Because true love looks out for other people's best, right? Can we all agree on that? True love looks out for people, other people's best. And when you show them that you love them more than you love Jesus, you in essence are saying that Jesus is not your greatest value. That he isn't most worthy of your highest love. And so by idolizing them over him, you lead them astray to devalue Jesus. And to find their own idols that they deem more worthy than him. That's not loving at all. That's unloving. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 37, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. But even harder, in many cases, than loving God more than family is loving Him more than we love ourselves. With all our heart. Loving Him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. But He calls us to do that. Our heart is to be undivided in its devotion to Him. Preferring Christ's ways over our ways, always. His desires over our desires. That's it. <laughs> check, check, check there. Jesus calls us to love him more than we love ourselves. With all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
to be undivided in our devotion to him, preferring Christ's ways over our ways, like I said, always. His desires over our desires. His purpose over our dreams. His eternal glory over our earthly gain. This devoted discipleship isn't just part of our week when we decide it fits in, but it's our life 24-7. Notice what else Jesus says this, our discipleship to him is, is to include. Verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. David Guzik says this. Listen, carrying a cross always led to death on a cross. The first hearers of Jesus didn't need an explanation of the cross. They knew it was an unrelenting instrument of torture, death, and humiliation. If someone took up his cross, he never came back. It was a one-way journey. End quote. So bearing our cross is living a devoted life as his disciple. One way. No turning back. No matter the shame, no matter the suffering, no matter the opposition it brings, even if it brings death. Loving Him more than our own lives, surrender to His will, we endure whatever it takes to follow Him. Modeling Jesus, who endured so much to the Father's, as He was surrendered to the Father's will. Listen, this is the Gospel. Jesus was as, as that beautiful, beautiful but ugly and real. Prophecy of him in Isaiah 53 says, Jesus was, Isaiah 53, 3, despised and rejected by men. He faced opposition. He faced rejection. The early believers in a prayer in Acts chapter 4 said this as they prayed to God, For truly in this city, they were in Jerusalem, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Jesus received rejection and opposition according to the plan of God. What was God's plan for Jesus? Isaiah 53.10 Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. To crush him. Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Listen. Jesus calls us bear our cross. To be willing to suffer whatever it takes to follow Him. And that's what He did. He came and He literally bore a cross. And He suffered rejection from men. And He suffered, he, he suffered dying for our sin. God crushed Him. It was the will of the Father to crush Him. Why? Because our sin needed a payment. In order for us to be made right with God, our sin had to be dealt with and if we were to deal with it without him, it would mean eternal hell for us. That would be the payment for our sin. But God said, I want to spend forever with, with you. I want you to spend forever with me. I want you to declare my glory now and forever. And so I'm going to send Christ to pay the penalty for you. To suffer my wrath for you. And I'm going to show you that that payment is completely paid for. I'm going to raise him from the dead. I'm going to promise you the hope of eternal life. I'm going to give you victory over sin. I'm going to give you brand new life, just like I gave Jesus new life whenever he raised from the dead. That if you put your faith and your trust in Christ, my wrath against you is satisfied because I took it out on Jesus. I'll forgive you and I'll treat you like you never sinned. I'll seat you with me in heavenly realms. You can come have a seat at my banquet table. You can be in my forever kingdom. Not because you deserve it, but because Jesus gives it to you as a free gift of grace. God's plan for Jesus was to submit to his Father's will to be crushed for that purpose. And he did. He bore his cross for us. No matter the shame, the opposition, 
the suffering or the death that the Father's will for Jesus required, he willingly endured it to win our salvation. And so should our devotion be to Jesus as his disciple. You guys know the hymn. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. So we live lives of daily dying to self, daily dying to selfish plans, daily dying to selfish pursuits and comforts and opinions and pleasures, all the while adopting the plans, the pursuits, and the pleasures of the kingdom of God, willing to suffer whatever doing so brings. Christians in name only, you know, you know what I mean by that, right? Christians who call themselves Christians but aren't really Christians. Christians in name only, they avoid this. But devoted disciples embrace this. Fighting the flesh, it's hard. Just ask Paul in Romans 7 when he said, I struggle so much. I, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. Fighting the flesh is hard. Fighting the desire to, to, to avoid suffering, that's hard. But by God's grace and strength, we can do it. Uh, Thabiti Anyabwili is his name. He's a pastor. Um, he, I think he's up near the D.C. area. Anyway, he says, Jesus teaches that cross-carrying is essential, not incidental, to the Christian life. It was for the, for the disciples, right? You remember? They were fishermen, some of them. Right? And, and they, they were living this life, you know, providing for everything. You know, things were cool, whatever. And Jesus said, come follow me. And they went from catching fish to seeking to catch people for Jesus, denying themselves, and then eventually being killed for Jesus. I'm sure bef those days before Jesus came to say, hey, man, come follow me. While they were out on their boats, they weren't thinking, hey, one day I'm going to die for this guy. I'm going to give my life for someone who claims to be God. They weren't thinking about that. But one day when Jesus came and they valued him as more worthy than themselves, they eventually ended up dying for him. They counted the cost. They bore their cross to follow him. Matthew 10, 38 to 39, Jesus says, And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So, that's true discipleship. And Jesus teaches us to count the cost. We look at that, now we've got to count the cost. Are we willing to be that disciple? So knowing what it means to truly follow him, Jesus says to count the cost before you do, and he uses two pictures to illustrate this. Listen to verses 28 through 32. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So he uses these two pictures of how we count the cost. In both pictures, check it. This is cool. The idea of sitting down is given, right? Sit down and count the cost. Sit down and deliberate. Sitting. Not just like, let's go, you know. This, this idea of sitting... Sitting down to count the cost of what it will take to build a tower. Sit down and deliberate to see if you can win the battle with lesser troops. This suggests to just pause, give some consideration before responding so quickly. Almost as if, are, are you really ready for this? Are you ready for the life that offering, that, that accepting the free gift of salvation is going to bring you? Are you willing? Are you ready? He's not trying to keep people away from following him. Oh, no. 
No, no, no. But he's trying to graciously prepare them for what it truly means to follow him. He doesn't want a bait and switch kind of thing here. No surprises. Here's what you're getting into. You ready for that type of devotion type thing? So, knowing what being a disciple really entails, we seriously consider whether we want it or not. We see if we're willing to pay the full cost to follow Jesus and go all the way with Him instead of making a flippant commitment, only to leave our tower unbuilt, turning away from following Him when loving Him more than anything or anyone, and bearing our cross when that gets too hard. In the case of the war picture, the idea may be similar. Thoughtfully deliberate and see if you're prepared before you hastily commit and fail. But two other ideas may be in, in mind here. The idea may be to sit down and determine the wisdom of fighting against God's discipleship demands. Can you afford to fight God? That won't end well. Maybe also the idea in this war picture is to seriously think about the wisdom of fighting sin, fighting Satan and the world your way as, as a half-hearted disciple, not as a devoted disciple of Christ. You'll compromise, you'll lose, and your testimony will be ruined. So any thoughtful deliberation will show that the only path of true victory is living as a devoted disciple of Christ in the way he calls for in those previous verses and in verse 33. This is what he says in verse 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Listen, this is an arrogant statement if you're not God. Give up everything and follow me. That's like getting married to somebody and saying, I don't care how you feel, what you think, what you want out of life, you're doing what I say the rest of your life. It's pretty arrogant. But if you're God, that's not an arrogant statement. And he is God. He is worth giving up everything for. Why? It's not arrogant because he's God. And it's incredibly loving. Why? Because the way God calls us to live is the best for us. Because that's, that's the way he designed us to live. And so him calling you to make him first in your life is the most loving thing he can do for you. So we say goodbye, we renounce, we forsake everything to follow Jesus. Fleshly desires, worldly possessions, everything. Nothing, nothing is in the exception category. It's not like we got a reserve tank over here of stuff, you know, okay, it's like our little secret candy stash, you know what I'm saying? You know, God, I'll give you all this, but... I got this over here you don't know about this. No, nothing is in that category. Nothing has such a hold on us that we couldn't let it go or leave it should he ask us or should it deter us from living as a true disciple. And everything we do have is his to use as he wants. Everything. Legan Duncan says, our stuff, our material possessions must be subservient to his purposes in our lives. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Just this past week, I've got some some college friends who really I only see them on you know on social media now, except for one. One I think kind of lives in the area. She married a guy named James. Um, her lifelong best friend was in our little college group, uh, and uh, her name is is Sarah. So it's so it's Stacy and James, and it's Sarah and Keith. Sarah and Keith were in our little college group. Stacy was in our little college group. But she married a guy named James. Anyway, to set that up. James, long story short, has been on dialysis for a while. Young guy, I mean, been on dialysis for a while. Ends up needing a kidney. Her lifelong best friend, Sarah, went to the hospital and found out she was a great match for James. And so just this past week, She went to a hospital in Charlotte where a doctor cut her open and took her kidney out of her and put it into James so that he could have his life back and live with his young kids. And I'll tell you that because I want to read for you what my buddy Keith, Sarah's husband, posted on the on while she was having surgery. Just a part of what he posted. Listen. That's what Keith says. What drives her to give away a small part of her is the consideration that Christ 
gave all, his very life for her freedom. Because of his sacrifice, her life is unreservedly given to him, even her kidneys. God, all of me is for you, and if you want to use one of my kidneys for James and your purpose in his life, it's yours. Wow. Jesus didn't give his all so we could give him just part of us. He wants all of us for his purpose. And here's the beauty of this. Because none of us live this way perfectly. None of us do. That's why this cannot be a, a passage on how you become a Christian. Because none of us will do this perfectly. It, it's because we don't live uh, this way perfectly. And it's because we fail at living this life in the way that he, he calls us to. That's the very reason why he died. So that he could treat us forever like we did live this life perfectly. And so, be, follow, because we don't live this life perfectly, and he died to give us his righteousness so we, he, he, he could treat us like we live this life, that's why we so want to go live this life for him. Out of just gracious worship, thankful, grateful worship, and obedience to the one who treats us like we don't deserve to be treated. I don't know what's going on, but another hymn line is popping up in this sermon. Now, when I survey the wondrous cross, love so amazing, so divine, demands what? My soul, my life, my all. Everything we have isn't enough to give him in comparison with what he gave us. So we give everything. Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. This is following Jesus. This is being his disciple. We don't water it down to a version of discipleship that fits our comforts. Sadly, David Platt says this, we want to follow a Jesus that doesn't require anything of us. End quote. We can't redefine Christianity. You can't call yourself a Christian and not act like it. Those who do so live in a delusion and lead others in the same delusion to both of their destruction. So, as we sit down and as we deliberate, as we count the cost, it's unmistakable. Living the way Jesus calls is worth it. As we think about it and as we share it with others, we need to be honest that loving Jesus above all, bearing our cross, renouncing all to follow Him, that is hard. It's hard. But we need to be honest that the reward for those who have trusted Him by faith and follow Him as a true disciple is worth it. The reward is so worth it. We get spiritual blessings now and forever. We get the truest and deepest joy, the truest and deepest hope, peace and comfort that can't be shaken. It can't be stolen by anything or anyone. We get His very presence in our lives, in the Holy Spirit, assuring us that we are His children. Oh, that in itself is a huge grace gift that every day you can walk with the presence of the Holy Spirit assuring us that we have been adopted as His sons and daughters in Christ. What a joy that supersedes anything that could happen in our lives. Anything that we could have in our lives. We get, we get the reward. We get help to endure the hardships that a life of discipleship brings. In fact, those hardships work for our good. Romans 8, 28. And best of all, we get a seat at His table and in His forever kingdom. Wow. Sure, there's hardships that following Jesus brings, but the benefits far outweigh them. This is Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. John Calvin says this, I gave up all for Christ, and what have I found? I have found everything 
in Christ. End quote. We don't follow Jesus because it's easy. We follow Jesus because he's worthy and it's best to do so. So, unbeliever, deliberate. Count cost. Are you ready to accept this free offer of salvation to a life totally committed to him? Believer, are you living this way now? Just very quickly, the end of this passage deals with salt. What is Jesus doing here? What's the connection here? We've got to be careful that we aren't like salt that's lost its taste. Listen to what Jesus says. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Salt in those days, it, it was valued. But if for whatever reason it, it lost that which gave it flavor, and you can research why that would happen back there, if it lost its flavor, it couldn't get its saltiness back. It was useless for taste or anything else. It was thrown out. Disciples of Jesus are to live as salt, living with the flavor of Jesus in the world, walking like he walked, loving like he loved, teaching as he taught, doing as he did, living as his devoted disciple in his footsteps, showing the world his character, his nature, his worth. But when the flavor of Jesus is replaced with the flavor of ourselves, we become useless for his purposes. Professing Christ, but not living as a devoted disciple or walking like he walked, it does him, it does us, it does the world no good. In fact, it can infect the church. Stealing the saltiness from fellow believers, causing them to live compromising lives as well. Did, did, did you catch that? Or is it just get, because I'm really almost done. Uh, I don't want you to lose that. You realize that not living as a devoted disciple of Jesus can bring somebody down in the church and cause them to live, live a compromising life too. It's like that old famous youth ministry illustration that we used um, to tell Christians not to date unchristians, right? You'd put, a, you'd put a Christian standing in a chair and you'd put someone standing on the floor and they'd grab hands and they'd say, okay, Christian, you pull that one up and uh, 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 non-Christian, you try to pull that one down. Well, who's going to have the most success? The one pulling down. You, you living as a non-devoted disciple of Jesus can be spiritually detrimental to the person sitting right beside you in this room and to the kids who live in your house and the family that comes to see you for Christmas and the friends that you recreate with and, and, and your, your employees that you work with, fellow workers. Believer, live a devoted, as a devoted disciple. Live a salty life. So that we don't, we don't steal the saltiness from other people's lives. Yeah, there are going to be times of selfish living for a real believer. We're not perfectly salty all the time. But those who profess Jesus don't display a general direction of devoted discipleship. Oh, let me say that again. Uh, there's going to be times of selfish living. But those who profess Jesus but don't display a general direction of devoted discipleship, they should be concerned does Jesus' declaration of the flavorless salt here when he says it's thrown out, does that have any specific meaning for professing believers who lose their saltiness? I don't know for sure. Certainly this is true. Hebrews talks about this. There are those that initially profess Christ, but their life proves they never were believers to begin with. They will be judged forever in hell. So whatever being thrown out means, if anything, it doesn't sound desirable. A, a true believer in Jesus would never want to hear that he or she is worthless to their king. So Jesus ends this teaching with, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So as we consider his call to discipleship, we must embrace it willingly while we still can. 
while the door is still open. It's worth it. If you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and if you're still alive, are you? Okay, my blood's pumping. If you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're still alive, He's left you here to live as a disciple, to spread the flavor of Christ to a bland, decaying world that desperately needs to accept His salvation and live as His disciple as well. Jesus counted the cost and He still came to save us. Nothing is too high a high price to pay to give our all to Him that gave His all for our salvation. It's our privilege to do so. Jesus is so, so worthy. Amen? Let's pray. God, how do we how do we say thanks for treating us in Christ like we live this way? God, as I, as I put the tape of my life in the VCR, and I hit rewind, I see a lot of lack of devotion for you. As I look at myself in the mirror, even today, I see such an imperfect life living this perfectly. I, but yet in Christ, by His amazing grace, you treat me as I have lived. God, I, God I, and anyone who is trusted in Christ as their Savior, the same is true. And so God, not out of just emotionless legalism or obligation, but God, out of worship and love and thanks, help us to, to take on this life that you have called us to and to make you our greatest value, that this world can see that you're the best, you're, you're worth following, that they may follow you as well be saved, know you. So God, I just I pray that for me, I pray that for my family, I pray that for my church family, and I pray that, that we would be salt in this world, make people thirsty for Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. in your bulletin. I think it's uh, the 8th, uh, Sunday night, the 8th. We're going to start the uh, Gospel Above All on a Sunday at 4 o'clock. Any of you who have done this on Wednesday night, remember we will finish up this week on that. But I tell you that to invite you, but also to say there's there's a, there's
there's a workbook that you will need to get, and there's another book that goes along with it that I would suggest that you get and, and read along with it. So I, I won't spend a lot of time on that. That's in your bulletin. I just tell you that so that you can, if you're interested in that, you can go ahead and order your books or let us know so that we can order your book for you. Uh, but, uh, it's been a, been a great day. Uh, hope you have a good afternoon. God bless you.